Hello, welcome to the Friday, September 11th, 2020 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Brad today is keeping us up to date on what Tridex is up to. Tridex, a very prolific malware family, has been kind of quiet the last few weeks, but looks like they're starting a new run. Now, the initial lure is very similar to what they have done in the past. It's a Word document that, of course, then tricks the user into enabling macros. In this case, it just states the document is created with an online version version of Microsoft Office and that's why you need to enable macros uh, to actually edit and view the document. Now as far as persistent goes in this particular version of Tridex, it uses Windows registry keys, it does add a scheduled task and then also adds a menu shortcut to Windows startup. Also note that Tridex is using legitimate Windows binaries in order to run itself. The way it accomplishes that is by copying a DLL file with a malicious code into the same directory as this uh, Windows binary. And then of course that DLL gets loaded as the Windows binary gets started and the malicious code is being executed. As usual, Brad is supplying you with links uh, to samples and traffic captures so you can use that to test your defenses and also to experiment a little bit yourself with recovering binaries and analyzing this traffic. And we've got a couple of security news items related to Zoom. First of all, a study that looked at Zoom bombings. Zoom bombings refers to strangers joining a Zoom call and disrupting the call. Now, what this study found is that the people that are performing these Zoom bombings, at least the vast majority of them, are, well, not so much strangers. They're not brute forcing meeting IDs. They're not uh, finding uh, passwords randomly posted on the internet. Instead, they're usually known to participants of the call and received meeting invitations legitimately, either from the organizer or being forwarded by individual participants. One practice that I have heard of in particular when it comes uh, to schools and such is where, for example, some students in class are passing on meeting invites to friends that are then being invited to essentially disrupt the class, to essentially get out of class. So a little bit kind of uh, the modern version, I guess, of pulling a fire alarm in the school to get out of school or get out of an exam. Now, in part, this is being enabled by the way Zoom does its meeting invites. Each meeting invite has a meeting ID and a password. The password is unique for the meeting, not unique to the particular user it's being sent to. So what they're suggesting is by having meeting invites that are unique to a particular user, if that user then forwards or leaks the meeting invite, well, at least you know who essentially did it and that may discourage this practice. In other Zoom news, Zoom today announced that uh, they enabled two-factor authentication for all of their accounts. Just uh, before I start recording uh, this podcast, I set it up myself. Pretty straightforward as typical for Zoom. The process is relatively painless. You can either use SMS or you can use uh, Authenticator, like Google Authenticator will work uh, for it. So up to you if you're feeling comfortable with SMS mess or not. And it will also then allow you to save some recovery codes. And it's pretty well sort of set up in that uh, you, the actual two-factor authentication doesn't become active until you downloaded the recovery codes. So to minimize the chances of you locking yourself out of your account. And the recent AMD security feature may have some 
unintended consequences and that's Platform Secure Boot. Platform Secure Boot is trying to solve this pretty hard problem of preventing malicious firmware being loaded into a motherboard or into a CPU. And in order to protect themselves, there is an option that can be enabled to essentially exchange certificates between motherboard and CPU to prevent then additional updates from happening later that are not properly authenticated. Now, uh, this is overall a good thing. It does prevent some of uh, these firmware attacks and such, but has a little bit an unintended side effect in locking a particular CPU to a motherboard. So once you applied the security feature, you can no longer move the CPU to a different system. Overall, this should not be a huge deal because, well, at least I myself don't typically move uh, CPUs around uh, between servers, but uh, if you expect to do that later, uh, you may want to be careful with applying the security feature. The reason it sort of came up was uh, that I believe it was Dell who originally uh, broke the news when they tested these CPUs and basically part of test moved them from system to system. They ran to problems because of platform secure boot. And then we got a new Bluetooth vulnerability. This one has been called Blurtooth and was discovered by two research groups independently, one at Purdue University and one at the Polytechnic Federal University at Lausanne. Now, the issue here is uh, the cross-transport key derivation that Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth Low Energy are using, and it's an implementation problem. So this is something that can be patched. Of course, patching Bluetooth devices has proven to be challenging in the past. Now the problem appears to be a little bit more limited than some older Bluetooth attacks in that it really only sort of allows devices that are already paired with a particular device to affect each other. So a stranger that has no prior relationship with this Bluetooth network would not be able to exploit this vulnerability. In effect, uh, someone who is already paired uh, could uh, swap encryption keys in other devices uh, connected and could then play machine in the middle attacks. But well, that's it for uh, today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.